I'm Dr. Eric Yankee. I am serving as the Dean of the College of Letters and Science, and this is part of our community lecture series, and I'm really glad that you all could, could make it out. Um, our speaker tonight is Dr. Sarah Scripps. Uh, she completed her doctorate in 2014 at uh, University of South Carolina, and she is going to talk to us about when it's, oh, this is part of your research, right? This is, this is yeah. Part of research. I, I really love it when um, our students here. Um, you get to actually hear a little bit more specifically about the kind of projects that our colleagues work on in graduate school. Um, so you get to hear about some of the work that also informs the kind of things that they teach. And so tonight we're going to hear about um, science fairs and course projects. Well, I just want to thank the College of Letters and Science, Dean Yonke, Scott Tappa, and everyone who made this talk possible. So thank you very much for inviting me tonight. Um, so as he meant, as uh, Dean Yonke mentioned, this is actually part of my dissertation project that I, when I looked at sort of children's understandings of science in contemporary America, and I focused particularly on science fairs. Um, I just wanted to do a show of hands. How many of you participated in some sort of science fair as a child? All right, like. It looks like three-fourths of you, maybe. Uh, I did as well. Mine was an inventor's fair in the sixth grade, and I invented soap afloat. And during my judging, the soap dish sank. <laughs> it was a dismal failure, and that ended my uh, science fair career. But um, I am still absolutely fascinated with them, um, because over the course of the 20th century, millions of children engaged in science fairs. And not only are science fairs ubiquitous, but I find them to be incredibly revealing. I would argue that the history of science fairs is actually a lens for understanding broader changes throughout American society. So I'm going to say that there are three sort of subplots to this bigger story about science fairs that we can kind of think about as we move forward in looking at this phenomenon. One is that this is a story about gender. The degree and manner of student participation differed across gender, class, regional, and racial lines. Um, and although science fair officials actively tried to recruit all types of children from all demographic makeups to join the science fair movement, white adolescent boys disproportionately rep were represented compared to their peers. Um, and so as a result, science fairs remained a predominantly masculine domain, but the story is much more complicated than that, and we're going to talk about that. So that's one sort of subplot here. Another is that this is a story about immigration and globalization. So the most avid science fair participants in the early years, as well as throughout the 20th century, were the children of immigrants, second generation Americans. And today, participants in the major science fairs come from countries all over the world. Um, I believe the most recent one had represented, or there were 78 countries represented. Um, and so there is this sort of promise of economic and social mobility attached to science fairs. And in this way, it sort of embodies the American dream. And so that's another subplot that we can think about as we kind of look at this phenomenon. And finally, and this is sort of the one that is why I titled my talk the way I did, is that this is really a story about the Cold War and Cold War politics. And that's really at the heart of my talk tonight. It probably comes as no surprise that the Cold War dramatically increased American fascinations with science. What's unique about science fairs, though, is that we can see how these anxieties played out through the eyes of children. And so my project, whenever possible, really tried to understand this from a child's eye view. Um, and looked at children as sort of pawns, but also participants in this larger story about the Cold War. Um, and so U.S. public officials identified the goal of creating talented leaders adept at science as a matter of national importance, even before Sputnik's orbit in 1957. Not only notions of childhood encapsulating um, American hopes for a peaceful future filled with international cooperation, but children themselves required grooming to be part of, become part of an educated workforce. So science fairs then embodied a tension often inherent when we talk about the Cold War and civil defense. Even as adolescents were heralded, heralded as promoters of peace and prosperity, 
They were also called to serve upon as future employees of the military industrial complex. So there are tensions here between peace and warfare, hope and uncertainty, and education and civil defense. And it meant that the science fair movement could accommodate myriad interests of a nation expanding its global influence. One thing that is fascinating about science fairs is that they started as a uniquely American phenomenon. The first science fairs in the United States were held in New York City. The American Institute of the City of New York, which was a scientific learned society, sponsored the first science fair in 1928. And the fact that the science fair movement came out of New York City was no accident. As a city that boasted world-class universities, museums and civic organizations, New York was uniquely equipped to provide a network of institutional support for exposing children to science outside of the classroom. And under the leadership of the American Institute, early child, uh, children's fairs received enthusiastic endorsement from local educational institutions. The city also developed elite public high schools specializing in science and technology, such as Stuyvesant, Brooklyn Technical High School, and the Bronx School of Science. Not only were these schools among the most active in the early science fair movement, but they continued to be dominant throughout the course of the history of science fairs and still to today. New York was also home to an enclave of immigrants, where a second generation of young people were coming of age in the 1920s and 30s. 30s, right as science fairs were um, originating. And these urban youngsters helped solidify adolescence as an identity separate from childhood on the one hand, but also from adulthood on the other. Historians have argued that the concept of adolescence itself was fundamentally shaped by these urban children of immigrants who stood at the precipice between being old enough to take part in like commercialized leisure that was on the rise at this time, but also still too young to get married, have a job, and enter the workforce. And so as adolescents engaged in popular amusements such as dance halls or Nickelodeons, adults became more concerned about controlling this leisure time through purposeful play. The impulse to control leisure then served as one of the major pedagogical underpinnings for starting these fairs. But another pedagogical origin of science fairs stemmed from a phenomenon known as nature study. So um, historians have studied the nature study mu movement of the late 19th, early 20th centuries um, and claim that it sort of advocated personal experiences with the natural world through careful scientific observation. And it advocated actively um, revising school curricula in order to incorporate student encounters with nature. And so in this regard, nature study then overlapped with broader efforts by progressive educational reformers, people like John Dewey, to encourage hands-on, experimental, scientifically-based forms of inquiry in order to train the next generation of democratic citizens. So creative partnerships with local organizations not only helped shoulder the financial burden of running these fairs, but they also directly shaped the fair's focus on children and nature study. Throughout New York City, scores of organizations worked towards introducing nature study to children. Organizations like the American Museum of Natural History, AMNH, in particular, served as a leading institution in promoting children's engagement with the natural world. Here are some images. The earliest science fairs were actually housed within the museum, as well as observations through nature rooms and, the thing, and um, sort of activities to promote nature study throughout its halls. Um, another group that co-coordinated the uh, first science fairs was the School Nature League, a local organization dedicated to fostering nature education in public schools. And many of these early nature study campaigns were run by female educators in particular. Nature study was driven by a lot of female um, educators who wanted these direct connections with nature between students and the natural world. And so early fair organizers firmly believed that nature study was not just an integral part of science education, but aligned with broader progressive goals of training citizens. Progressive educators believed that school was not just a place for learning about future expectations of adulthood, but should be an integral part of students' life experiences. 
they argued that the more that education integrated with sort of daily living, the more likely students would be able to pr um, produce sort of make broader generalizations about the world and generate productive habits of thought. It was through this idea of learning by doing, the ability for children to engage in scientific inquiry on their own terms that really appealed to these progressive nature study educators. By providing children with opportunities to crystallize their own ideas, educational reformers hoped the, the children's fairs would encourage children to serve as productive and scientifically minded citizens. So, the earliest children's fairs of the 1920s then reflected many of these educational aims of progressivism and nature study. It featured dozens of categories ranging from topical entries in trees or mammals to thematic categories such as conservation or biological principles. Both elementary aged as well as older children were encouraged to apply. Um, and the first um, children's fair was held by the American Institute in 1928 and attracted about 35,000 spectators. The exhibits that uh, were showcased during these earliest fairs appeared reminiscent more of what you might think of as agricultural displays at a county fair. So here's an example of an earliest exhibit from these children's fairs. This is a project of a boy posing proudly next to his school's community garden project. You can see this tie to nature study here, right? The display featured a careful arrangement of tobacco, pumpkins, beets, corn, and oats. <laughs> um, and the crops were grown for observation and study and surveyed for their annual yield. So the fact that there is this sort of agricultural nature study display is sort of surprising. Um, but I think what's even more surprising is the fact that within a decade, this would completely disappear. That by then, the science fair movement would look a lot more similar to sort of what we think about when we think about science fairs today. Um, and so this transformation, um, this 10-year transformation, is indicative of the profound changes in extracurricular science throughout the 20s and 30s. Through, though nature study championed children's interaction with the natural world, it soon was supplanted by an emphasis on disciplinary distinctions more reminiscent of contemporary science fairs. So these older categories where you'd show your crop yield would soon be replaced by a new model for what these fairs would look like. The annual children's fairs proved so popular that in 1932, despite the Great Depression being right at the height of the Great Depression, the American Institute expanded its youth offerings and thousands of children participated in either the fairs or in the affiliated science club that were clubs that were created alongside these. Early on, however, Fair organizers began to question the extent to which the fair should be devoted to nature study. By 1932, the Children's Science Fair featured just 10 categories, keeping some of the older classes like plant and animal life, but also adding new fields like physics, chemistry, and the history of science. With these changes, the newly named Children's Science Fair, it was used to be named the Children's Fair, and now it was named the Children's Science Fair, marked a departure from nature study and these more agricultural expositions. Even though the science fairs were focused less on nature study and more on science, projects of early fairs look very different from the science fair projects that we typically think of today. So they often conveyed science actually more through a visual narrative, weaving together a unified story about science. Um, educators believed that vi vivid reconstructions of the natural world could supplant actual physical encounters in nature and that it would allow for visitors to participate in visual observation and scientific reasoning. And so what you see is that early children's fairs appropriated dioramic forms of display, which perhaps isn't super surprising when we think that these exhibits were also housed in the uh, American Museum of Natural History. Students situated their exhibits within a broader visual contract context in order to convey a story. So here's an example of one of these dioramic types of science fair projects. In this exhibit that was called Coalville, students from Brooklyn provided a comprehensive display of the coal mining industry 
The exhibit featured not just the operation of mechanical equipment, but also offered scenes of a mining community. Through the detailed recreation of a coal mine, elevator shaft, office, huts of workers, and a general store. The students constructed the exhibit at their school workshop, they used soap for the coal cars, an erector set for the houses, newspaper, flour, water, and sand for the terrain. And they also um, created a little booklet that told the story of coal in America. The display won first prize by applying scientific modes of thought to provide a comprehensive synthesis of story about the mining industry. Its emphasis was less on demonstrating scientific principles than it was on the practical uses of science and its pervasiveness in daily life. So another interesting theme that was part of these early science fair um, displays was thinking about in having an educated consumer. So indeed, like how children would enter the consumer marketplace was considered part and parcel to scientific training deemed necessary to fulfill their responsibility as educated citizens. Um, so here is an example of a project that really emphasized this idea of an educated consumer. This is a project that was created by um, 20 students and it was called How My Lassie Got Her Clothes. And what you see is actually six vignettes of our, the origins of clothing. So there's a cotton plantation in Georgia. There are Japanese silkworms. There is a Brazilian rubber plantation and a Texan tex cattle ranch. And then the doll, that's Lassie right there. She's sort of centered in the middle of this display. And um, she is... Um, surrounded by cards pointing to the material origins of each garment. So you can see here it's really educating consumers about where their clothing comes from. Here's an example of a cartoon that sort of plays on the idea of children being educated consumers. So this was published in one of the early science fair magazines and it's showing two car salesmen that are trying to sort of use you know these fancy language to sell a car and the boy on the right is saying, I'm taking chemistry at high school and I can't see it from a fundamental and basic viewpoint. In the background you see two guys talking and they say, they have to sell the boy or the dad won't buy. <laughs> and so it's showing right this attempt at educating um, future consumers in scientific, and using scientific literacy as a way to understand consumerism, which I find to be an interesting sort of mix. From the onset, America, the American Institute welcomed narrative expression by inviting students to submit articles to their newsletter. And the stories were not just run-of-the-mill accounts about science. They also had this spirit of playfulness. Adolescents wrote poems and jokes and plays um, and possessed sort of flexible boundaries about what counted as legitimate scientific expression. So here's an example of a poem that was written um, called The Atomic Sonata. And it's um, the student said, Adam, little Adam, you are so very small. I sometimes sit and wonder if you are there at all. When Dalton first discovered you, I bet he nearly dropped as tinkering in the lab one day right up at him you popped. <laughs> and it sort of goes on from there. So you sort of see this like uh, attempt at um, kind of a more expressive form of scientific um, uh, understanding, right? Club members also share jokes, things like what animal has more lives than cats? Frogs, because they croak every night. <laughs> and playlets were written and performed by students as um, another kind of example of this um, playfulness that you'd often see in these early science fair communities. So a typical trope of these stories placed an emphasis on children's expertise. Um, this was from, uh, this is a sketch that was alongside a play called Leeuwenhoek and his Discover discoveries and it offered a fictional account of Leeuwenhoek and his daughter Maria. And as Leeuwenhoek worked on developing the microscope, 
Maria, the, his daughter, was his assistant, and it turns out that she was the one who helped kind of make these discoveries through the microscope and share them with the Royal Society. And so you see this sort of agency of you know, children being these active scientific um, experts, right? So ultimately, the gender ma makeup of both science fairs and clubs that are affiliated with these fairs remained predominantly male throughout the 30s. Female students typically constituted 20% of individual science fair projects. When evaluating club entries, however, because you could submit science fair projects as a group, female participation jumped to between 35 and 40%, suggesting that the fact that students could work together on a project proved particularly appealing to female students. In addition, the vast majority of poems and plays, over 80% were written by girls, serving as an outlet that celebrated sort of a different form of scientific expertise and looking at scientific communication. In addition, the majority of the students who participated in these fairs were second generation immigrants. According to a survey of one of these children's programs, 81% of students had at least one parent who was born outside of the United States, and 6% of students were themselves foreign born. Most parents um, in the, um, of the students during these early fairs came from countries like Germany, Poland, Hungary, Austria, or Italy, and students of Jewish descent were particularly drawn to participating in science fairs. At the same time, I found very few examples of African American students or children of other ethnic groups participating in these programs. And so it showed that there still were limitations at who kind of envisioned themselves as belonging to this community that was forming. So you see here kind of this, you know, moment where science fairs look very narrative driven, um, you know, kind of playful in the mode of communication that was delivered, but that would change. <laughs> the science competitions of the 40s and 50s operated in a very different socio-political landscape than the Depression era predecessors. Americans began reevaluating the role of science in society after witnessing the devastation of a global cataclysm. World War II was a watershed, not just in terms of the scale of devastation, but also in the mobilization of science for the war effort. The union of science and national security spurred new projections for the role science should play in the polity. The advent of big science, right? The vast increase of cost, scale, and complexity of scientific ventures led to large-scale organizational structures that spanned industry, government, and academia, right? The military-industrial complex. The growth of the scientific establishment stoked anxieties about the sort of workforce that would be needed to maintain American intellectual and technological superiority. And this turn towards big science also meant that a confluence of special interests sought to shape science education. We're talking scientists, educators, government organizations, and industry, all having a role in working with these extracurricular fairs. And so in the process, extracurricular science was less of an expressive outlet of free play and more of a mechanism of socialization that prepared students for this post-war world. Considering that early programs focused on these progressive aims of cultivating proper habits of thought and civic education, what form would science fairs take to meet these new realities of the post-war world? So, in the years preceding the National Defense Education Act of 1958, the Science Service, a nonprofit news organization, championed the cause. Um, so, when the, um, it's con I should mention that Westinghouse Electric actually became a sponsor of many of these early fairs, but they quickly ended their contract with the American Institute and instead decided to par uh, partner up with the Science Service, who then became the agency that really um, began to uh, form a national network of science fairs. And so, um, in 1942, the Science Service held its first science talent search, 
This competition sought out the most talented high school seniors by selecting 40 young men and women to compete in Washington, D.C. for scholarship money. It's a big deal. It still is today. They often get to meet with the president. They get a tour of Washington, D.C. They get to showcase their projects to politicians. Um, and so it was, it's a huge honor to be named one of these 40 finalists. Um, and so what you have here um, are some of the pro programs that the science fair um, created um, over the course of the 40s and into 1950. The Science Clubs of America was a national network of science clubs. Um, the Science Talent Search, which I just mentioned, was formed in 1942. And then the first national science fair was held by the Science Service in 1950. Though by this time, many other communities across America were holding their own local and regional competitions, much like what New York City was already doing. So, when the Soviet Union launched Sputnik in 1957, it galvanized the science fair movement. In 1957, about 250,000 students participated in local and national fairs, but by 1962, so over the span of five years, the number had quadrupled to approximately one million participants. And the work of the Science Service complemented other initiatives that were widespread at the time, right? We got Walt Disney's Our Friend the Atom, <laughs> um, other types of you know, attempts um, to both educate and ameliorate public anxieties surrounding the advancements of post-war science. Um, but science fairs themselves became very much entangled with the military-industrial complex. It's probably not surprising given the sponsorship by Westinghouse Electric, um, it, which provided this direct link to the world of industrial research. Um, in 1953, the Science Service hosted the National Science Fair at Oak Ridge, Tennessee. <laughs> And so the selection of the militarized site of Oak Ridge further solidified the entanglement between science fairs and civil defense in a very concrete way. Um, and so you can see then that the stakes here were rising. And with these higher stakes, it shaped who was targeted as a potential future scientist, right? There was this great anxiety about who was going to lead the country in these scientific pursuits. And although boys had often been targeted for these. The um, Science Service actively attempted to recruit young women. Um, they also were very, they, they wanted you know, different ethnic and racial minorities represented at these science fairs as well. However, they weren't very good at doing that. <laughs> um, we, as you can see here, this may be, um, do I have another, let me see, I don't know what my next image is, if it shows a little bit better. Um, we'll get there. You can see sort of the composition of the, the participants of both Science Talent Search as well as the National Science Fair. It's predominantly uh, white male, but females and some uh, minority students also did participate, but they were markedly limited in their participation. So unlike the focus of earlier science fairs on sort of a narrative or a holistic view of science, post-war Fairs prized specificity and solutions to contemporary problems. Students conceptualized their products not in terms of a story, but in terms of a problem that they needed to solve. In addition, virtually all of the projects represented the success of lone individuals. Participants could not submit projects as groups, even though several finalists recognized the outside assistance that they received from parents, fellow students, teachers, etc. But they received sole credit for their work. Generally, students' presentations emphasize procedures and results based on measurable outcomes. And here you can see sort of your prototype, your typical science fair exhibit of the mid-1950s, featuring you know, a display, a single, double, or trifold display, with text explaining the goal, methods, and results of the project. Um, in this uh, example, you see Von Nasser describing her experiment in producing penicillin broth. And you have the headings of her display. It's protecting, producing, and processing, offering a step-by-step -step explanation of her technique along with its potential commercial value. Um, and in front, Nasser displayed her microscope along with several slides. Um, and so you see here that she's really explaining this through more of a textual analysis rather than sort of a visual narrative, right? It's more about you know, drawing 
conclusions through text rather than having some sort of um, dioramic explanation through that kind of form of display. And so, during the 1950s and 60s, the displays of participants continued to homogenize with textual results-oriented descriptions that placed little emphasis on aesthetics. Um, and you see that by 1970, virtually every single publicized product, project featured this sort of large textual display with the notable exception of collection displays, which would show sort of series of collections. But other than that, almost all science fair projects that were sent to the national level looked like this. And so um, what you see here is that um, it's sort of reflecting the values of science changing, right? And how students are supposed to see, perceive what science is and why it matters to society. This highly individualized system of recognition also underscored the competition's underlying attention to reward students based on inherent ability. Um, and so there was a very meritocratic vetting process that was intended to sort of level the playing field. They would give out a national exam for science talent search. Everyone would take the exam and supposedly, right, just by, based on innate ability, they'd find the most talented students. However, <laughs> when you look at the geographic makeup of finalists, you'd see that it's a little skewed. Areas in the south and southwest generally perform performed way below other areas like the northeast, midwest, and the midwest. And as of 1946, 18 states had never had a student finalist in the science talent search. And on the other end of the spectrum, in the first six years of the competition, New York had 54 finalists. <laughs> um, and of course, this is perhaps not surprising since that New York is where science fairs originated. But nevertheless, you see that um, these disparities also varied from school to school. Um, in the 1950 competition, 22 finalists came from schools with no previous representation in the contest. That meant that all the remaining students had um, students that were representing schools that had been there before. So the Science Service actually did attempt um, recruitment of people, particularly young women. <laughs> it selected the number of science talent search finalists of each gender in proportion to their percentage of applicants. Um, and until 1948, appointed one male student and one female student um, each year as a winner. Um, and promotional materials celebrated female finalists. Oops. Um, um, claiming that you know, they eventually would pursue full-time employment as scientists. And also cited examples of women who b successfully balanced homemaking with their careers. So these promotional messages never challenged the notion of women's domestic responsibilities, but rather suggested it was possible for women to be successful both at home and in the workplace, right? So science service officials extended this promotional campaign even further by actually visiting participants at home <laughs> i mean they were very they collected all sorts of data the height and weight of participants um, their parents occupations where they went to school their eventual careers it's amazing the records that we actually have on many of these students um, and what you see is that these photographs these promotional photographs depicted students not just as engaged scientists but these well-adjusted teenagers right <laughs> um, you see on the left, this is um, a photograph of Alan Hout, who was a senior, um, and it shows that he's not just interested in working with his homemade spectroscope, but he likes listening to records with his friends, right? And on the right, we have Mary, who did not just conduct experiments on colorblindness, but she also enjoyed baking pies, right? <laughs> and so it, it reflected these mixed signals, young women in particular, but all kind of youth that were participating in it, um, received regarding their roles as both professionals and people who were like well-adjusted in society. Um, but in spite of all these promotional efforts, the proportion of female applicants consistently hovered at around 20%. Um, and perhaps this is due to the fact that um, the science talent search's strict meritocratic objective often overlooked unique challenges that female participants face. Um, 
the alumni of this program reported getting paid significantly less than their male counterparts. Likewise, the pressures of pursuing a career while balancing familial responsibilities proved challenging for many women. As one alumnus declared, this business of combining two careers, marriage and chemistry, is interesting, entertaining, and above all, time consuming. I am still doing work for Sinclair Research Labs and have the honor of being the only female in the lab with my name on the door. So you see that these disproportionate kind of representations in participation were not, um, not just limited to gender or geographic location. Um, but you also see that other groups um, were represented differently. Students of Catholic faith um, did not of often participate in these uh, competitions. Only one African American participated in the earliest um, science talent searches. Um, however, other groups, such as students of Jewish descent, um, often uh, were overrepresented um, at these uh, science fairs. And so, what you also see is that um, the science service actively tried to showcase diversity as a way to try to recruit more students. For instance, um, one student, um, Edward Kazauer, who actually organized his own chemical manufacturing business. That's why he was entered into the Science Town Search. I should also mention these students are incredibly talented. Um, he was actually appeared on the radio show conducted by the Science Service um, alongside his father, who was a Brooklyn cab driver. And uh, the radio host asked the Kazowers to find out how to train the potential scientists of tomorrow, using them as an, as an example of a working class family who made the time and effort for their child to pursue scientific hobbies, right? Um, at the same time, the Sur Science Service did not um, address distinct challenges facing other students. Um, the, the first uh, African American science talent search finalist that I mentioned, um, her name was Nancy Durant. She was not allowed entry into several restaurants in Washington, D.C. when she went down for the competition. And so they ended up having to eat at the YWCA. Um, and it sort of reflected these broader societal structural issues at play that were sort of um, showing why <laughs> certain people were nav um, uh, participating in this and others weren't. But for whatever reason, the science service didn't really address it at that level. They sort of remained at the superficial promotional level of things. So um, I've been talking a lot about the national, or the science talent search. But the National Science Fair, another program of the science service, did show greater diversity. Um, female students were more highly represented. 35% of the participants were young women. Um, and um, during some of the early fairs, you do see more African-American students participating. Um, and so there are, um, there's a little bit more diversity and representation. Um, and numerous science fair students reported that their parents were immigrants from Russia and other Eastern European countries. And one student's parents had moved to the United States from Japan. So you begin seeing this immigration story play out throughout these um, science fair projects. The vast majority of um, alums from both of these programs, the Science Talent Search and the Science Fair, um, pursued higher education. 97% of men and 92% of women attended some college after high school. And ultimately, about 75% of Science Fair finalists chose to enter scientific, technical, or related occupations. And yet, future career choices often broke down along gender lines. Men more often chose careers in engineering, physics, and mathematics. And women were more likely to work as nurses, techno um, technicians, and biologists. Um, studies also showed how marriage affected women's career decisions. About 60% of female respondents were still single. And the 38% who were still married, um, of that number, 25% stayed in their career field after college. 50% left their career temporarily to start their, your, their families, and 25% left their fields completely in, with no intent to return. And so women um, sort of, you can see there, the, the needs of having to serve the household kind of in contrast with these career ambitions that many of these women um, had and when they had been participating at the national level in these fairs. Um, that said, the early years of these competitions proved 
markedly successful at achieving its aims, its aims in cultivating the next generation of leading scientists. Out of the early finalists, four would become Nobel laureates, and I think this is in the first 10 years of these programs. Two would win the National Medal of Science, one would win a Fields Medal, and one would become a MacArthur Fellow. And so when you evaluate where students um, oh, here, here's that image I was looking at. So this kind of shows you the representation of finalists from a random given year of the science talent search. You can kind of see the gender breakdown um, here. Anyways. Okay, so here are the top universities attended by science talent search finalists um, during the first 10 years. 18% went to Harvard, 7% went to MIT, Six to seven percent went to Cornell, and you also have Columbia, Caltech, and University of Chicago represented. So um, it's important to note too that four out of the four of these schools also received the highest R&D contracts in the nation. <laughs> so this military-industrial complex um, relationship is very much kind of entangled in all of this. Um, finalists often listed their first occupations of employment at sites like Oak Ridge or Westinghouse, the Atomic Power Division, the US Army um, Warfare Center, or simply they would say that their position was classified, right? And so you see the Cold War playing out in many of the decisions of their future careers. What's fascinating though is that as science fairs cemented their ubiquity domestically, the phenomenon also spread beyond American borders. In 1957, the National Science Fair opened its eligibility to international students and began showcasing American projects across the world. So two Japanese representatives from uh, traveled to the United States participating in the ninth annual science fair. Um, and Japanese officials subsequently started their own competitions modeled after the American fairs that they had witnessed. By 1962, the Am Atomic um, uh, Energy Commission began partnering with the Science Service to employ science fairs as a mode of cultural diplomacy um, that could support its objective in facilitating scientific and technical training in particularly Latin American countries. This is 1962, and you think about you know, what's happening, Cuban Missile Crisis and the like, perhaps it makes more sense. Through financial support by the AEC, the Science Service worked with international le leaders to initiate science fair programs in countries like Mexico, Chile, Uruguay, Colombia, El Salvador, and Guatemala. In the battle to demonstrate American scientific authority, science fair participants were recruited as cultural ambassadors to tout the virtues of science abroad. So in Europe, American students were um, invited to participate in many European youth programs that were emerging and modeled after sort of what was happening in the United States. And in a program called Operation Cherry Blossom, <laughs> three science fair finalists were sponsored by the US Army to serve as uh, special representatives of the armed forces in Japan. And while students showcased their projects, they spent time visiting Japanese families and students. And so you see here that American students in these cases were not merely symbolic of ingenuity or sort of serving in this kind of showing American might abroad, but were actually on the ground serving as these cultural um, ambassadors. During the 60s, science fairs remained widespread and the number of participants quadrupled. The um, 17th National Science Fair boasted representatives um, from 227 separate local fairs um, and included 11 students from foreign countries like West Germany, the Philippines, Costa Rica, and Puerto Rico. Um, the science fairs um, still, of course, continue today. Today, they are sponsored by Regeneron for the Science Talent Search and Intel for the um, International Science and Engineering Fair, which is what the science fair is now called. Um, and they continue to serve as the premier science competitions recognizing talented high schoolers across the world. And remember one of those threads, this thread of immigration. American students from immigrant families are, are still consistently representatives, but um, more students claimed heritage from Asian countries, including Taiwan, India, China, and Japan. Science fairs continue to garner participation from youth around the world. In 2017, more than 1,700 students representing 78 countries took part in the science fair. For many of these students, science fairs represent the possibility for social and economic mobility, transcending national borders.
For those interested in learning more, kind of about, oh, here's a picture of one of the recent cohorts of the science talent search. So you can see here sort of how the composition um, is changing. And currently, from the kind of rough estimates I was doing, it's about, I would say, between 35 and 45 percent um, female representation um, in the most recent cohorts. But if you want to learn more about science fairs and kind of the current chapter, right, since I focused a lot on what was happening in the Cold War, there were two movies that came out last year that focused on these um, programs. One was called Science Fair, and the other one is called Inventing Tomorrow. Um, they both received nearly 100% approval ratings on Rotten Tomatoes. <laughs> so for what that's worth. Although science fairs started as popular amusements, they transformed to serve as sites for the goals of ensuring national security and cultivating future scientists converged. These competitions represented a growing extracurricular movement sweeping both the nation and the world. Though science fairs operated as a uniquely American phenomenon prior to World War II, by the early 1960s, science fairs reached beyond the nation's borders. In the decades that followed, the competitions put in place a standard for youth scientific engagement emulated across the world. By encouraging global participation, science fairs proved to be an effective outlet for expressing American hegemonic notions of science under the pretext of international cooperation. Young people served as powerful symbols of American scientific might, and by extension, the nation's position of authority during and after the age of Sputnik. And that's what I have for you. So thank you so much. And so I am happy to field any questions or comments that anyone might have. Yeah. Along uh, like racial and minority lines in the uh, early days, was it, uh, did they actually try to <laughs> get it more diverse or did they just say that they were doing that? So they were definitely more fo focused on gender equity than they were on racial equity. Um, I did see a couple examples of clubs of students from places like Harlem um, that were predominantly African American schools represented, but they were definitely exceptions rather than the norm. And so, yeah, that push is not as great, though they definitely, you know, um, tracked. Uh, the ethnic racial composition of their participants. So they definitely cared about that, but they sort of were at a stumbling point in terms of how to make it more diverse. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how involved were um, like government agencies in trying to cultivate <laughs> the kids, like, like a NASA or you know, kind of, uh, even just like the US Army or you know, oh, yeah, the military, they... uh, in like having their fingers involved in very involved so they actually offered specific scholarships like the US mm -hmm. Army would sponsor a scholarship or even like a certain industry um, would sponsor a scholarship focusing on whatever it is that they were hoping students would study mm -hmm. right and those officials would actually come to the science fairs use them as recruitment opportunities for future employment so it was very much entangled with all of that yeah Yes. Except a lot of scientists, mostly scientists that work on climate, would tell you that the future is very bleak. <laughs> so, and that's a story of nationalism, right? That yeah. That science is in the service of nationalism, which you guys have you know, laid out there. Was there ever a moment in sort of science fair history where they either, one, had opportunities for critiques of the military industrial complex and science for national security, uh, and, or you know, so a global perspective, let's say, or two, that where there was explicitly, you know, uh, <clears throat> categories for science and society rather than just simple rational technical knowledge about nature, but about its impacts on society. So both actually happened. In terms of science and society, in um, looking at not just sort of 
principles of science or technical, like um, technical skills, right, um, tacit knowledge, they would be focused a lot more on its applicability to solving contemporary problems. So that definitely was a phenomenon that was happening in the post-war world. Um, in terms of your earlier question about sort of uh, thinking about this outside of the, the lens of nationalism in which this emerged, What's really fascinating is that they often interviewed science fair participants after they entered the workforce in part of this military industrial complex. And many participants responded with this great ambivalence about the role of science in society. So it wasn't driven so much by the, the fair apparatus itself, but by the participants who actually end up going on the ground and getting exposure to this as they you know, become adults, that there is this great ambivalence about the role of science in society. And in terms of this movie, Inventing Tomorrow, I have to admit I haven't seen it yet, but it actually focuses on students from, um, let me see if I have it written, but like students from kind of uh, more third world countries, places like Costa Rica and the like, and talking about sort of, you know, giving this optimism that this is a kind of a way for economic mobility, right? So that's what's, I think that's where the title comes from. Though admittedly I haven't watched it, so. Yeah. Yeah. So I know you're still researching this project, and I happen to know that you're going to the Smithsonian <laughs> next week. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about what you'll be doing in Washington and what collections you'll be uh, researching and how that relates to uh, what you talked about tonight? Yeah, so a lot of, of another sort of sub part or sub component to this broader project is looking at media and the role of media in this. And so I'm going to be actually looking at the records of Watch Mr. Wizard, who is, and Bill Nye the Science Guy too, actually. They want me to look at those as well I'm there. So I'm going to be looking at sort of these telev scientific television shows. Um, and I'm also going to be looking at um, the records of the amateur scientist of the Scientific American, which had a lot of children that submitted like um, ideas for projects and whatnot. And a it created this really real tight-knit community of like hobbyists essentially. So I'm going to be looking at those records as well. And it was so sad that my trip, I was going to share that research with you guys today, but my, my trip got canceled due to the shutdown, so I had to postpone it. <laughs> what sort of my hypothesis on it, uh, I would assume with just a wizard, like a spike in interest, or are you going to kind of look at that correlation of kids entering science fields and college and things like that? And, I have no idea what I'm going to find. I don't know what the records entail. Um, and so I don't know if it's like just looking at sketches for the show, if it's going to have a lot of, I'm hoping to find correspondence with children who write in. They also had a group of clubs associated with the show. I'm hoping there's stuff about that. I don't know what I'm going to find. That's, that's the fun, right, the hunt. Yeah. I don't know exactly how far up the project, uh, you know, the project goes, but in looking at these films that you have, um, uh, you know, it, it makes me think about how, um, you know, the connection with the military-industrial complex that you laid out so nicely in the era of Sputnik, um, how that might be then changing as you get into, you know, the 90s and the 2000s and today. And so I'm wondering if maybe you can say a little something about that, because it, is it still? Do you see it as sort of still closely tied to the military industrial complex, or is it now kind of the world of Intel, the world of <laughs> Facebook, the world of Google, the world of Amazon, hey Google, et cetera, um, that is kind of taking the lead in, um, in sponsorship, um, you know, sponsoring um, you know, scholarships, you know, things like that. Is that kind of like the, you know, the next chapter that it's moving in that direction? So, yes, I think that switch from Westinghouse to Intel is very telling, right? Um, and so that is certainly something, I'm going to be honest, I haven't spent too much time on the very recent science fair stuff, but I do go up into the 70s. In the 70s is really where I ended my project when I worked on it before because there is a major turn that happens again with this idea of ambivalence around science that Jerry sort of alluded to, um, that you see the tone of projects changing and the composition of students who participate change alongside that. So that's an interesting turning point and I would say marking the end of the era that I study. So.
Well, thank you so much for coming. It's an honor to share this with you. I really appreciate you coming out tonight. And um, yeah. <laughs>